Awesome. Well, thank you. It was fun to meet Matt and go back to my own childhood of the 1990s. Uh, makes me feel old. So let's give them another round of applause. And crucially, let's give everybody a round of applause for such great presentations. Now, before we turn it over to audience q and I'm going to invite our two Jaroslawski fellows to come up and do probably the toughest job of the night and come up with some reflections on the fly after watching presentations one minute ago. So if we could just give David and Mimi a round of applause as they come up. <laughs> Great, and I know our, our students are super thrilled to have been able to get to know them over the screen and now get to know them in person. So thanks both of you for coming up and sharing yeah. some thoughts. To be clear, we were informed that we'd be doing this about two hours ago. So, oh, no, no, just, <laughs> just be so should we just start reflecting? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have to say, I'm deeply impressed at so many levels. Um, first of all, just the, the talent that was exhibited in so many of the exhibits was world class in mm. some ways, if I may say that. Um, it was the incredible display of creativity. My mind got stretched in so many directions, which was, I was not expecting to be honest. It actually blew me away and how, um, just how creative the thought that went into some of these projects were. I'm also um, amazed just the quality of the discussions we had. I know uh, there's a Q and A period now, but I mean, didn't just spend the day talking to, you know, asking various questions. Um, you guys are thinking about some really important issues and thinking really deeply and it's so uh, motivating and inspiring to see this happening at this level in, in school. And then just even the whole course itself, you know, we talk about the future of work, future of education, cross-disciplinary collaboration, creative problem solving. It's like, yeah, this is it. You guys are doing it right now. So you know, you're all, you're the experts. Uh, you're making the future happen right here. So uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm hogging the mic here. No, I no, please <laughs> contribute. It's just, uh, I mean, you should all feel, I, I, don't, I don't think you guys realize what a wonderful thing you've been part of and what, you're, what you've learned yet. I think it will play out over time. I'm excited for you, all of you because you have such an exciting you know, life ahead of you. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to be, have been part of this special class, uh, having a spe special experience together. And I know it's something you'll carry with you for a long time. So congratulations to all of you. And thank you for the opportunity to be involved. It's uh, been a true honor and a pleasure. And uh, it was, I learned a ton myself, and it was really fun, too. And, and what more could you ask other than, you know, a fun learning experience mm. that helps make the world a better place, right? Mm. Okay, I'll shut up now. Go ahead. <laughs> it's good. I am not very good off the fly, so I took notes while all of you were talking. <laughs> Actually, I have lots of feedback, but what I uh, did, I'm not going to say all of it to all of you, but I will say that I think that, so I was coming at this more from looking at your your work as pieces, as like art projects, and so thinking about them as such. And I think it's really something that just David really touched on, is that there's no real way to document the process of coming up with something, and so it's easy to forget or dismiss it, but I hope that all of you do hold on to that, because it is true that this sort of interdisciplinary coming together is very important and really rare, I think, in a lot of these environments. So all of you are in a good spot. Okay, David, you're all right. Okay. <laughs> I'm documenting this. I want to document this. We're in this together. Come on. Go ahead. We're here. <laughs> okay. So here are, um, these are the realizations that I kind of came, was thinking about when I listened to all of you talking and what I hope that all of you will walk away with. One, the first one, there are four. <laughs> the first one is that when you're making a piece, you think before you make it to come up with a concept. Then you think through making it. And then afterwards, you iterate on it. Mm -hmm. And so that last part, I'm really sneaking in because I think a lot of you have things that if you do, like, do one more round of iteration on it, you will have a really good project. Not that it's not good already, but it still some of them still need some tweaks. Sorry, y'all, I'm in professor mode. So, but that last... Can I add to that as Oh, well? yeah, please. Like, absolutely. In, in my line of work, we'll go make something like you, that you guys did. We'll try our hardest. We'll pour our heart and soul into it. And we'll go home saying, wow, that was amazing. And then we come back the next day and say, you know what? This sucks. Yeah. Let's redo it. And you do that enough times, and then you start to, you, you find the magic in it. You find the thing that you want to celebrate, and you, and you pair away the other stuff. De I, yeah. Definitely. So I yeah. encourage all of you, don't think of this just as a class. Some of you, I think, really have projects where you could take it into another direction if you're willing to really work on it. That's one thing. The second thing is actually just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm going to leave that at that. 
Uh, the third one is that I noticed some of you really demonstrated what, um, and jump in whatever, uh, some of you demonstrated something like uh, something that exists, whereas some of you tried to assert what could be. Either way, I think that where you the places uh, that succeeded the most were when you got into a place that surprised even you. And so some of you talked about this, where you're like, oh, we didn't, we didn't know about this stuff, and now we do after having done this. And I think that when you get to that point when you're making a piece and you're not doing just this is what I think and now I've showed it to people, but you, you're surprised by what you did, that is, that's when yeah. you know you're at a good point. And that also happens when you work with people you've never, from different backgrounds, you have no idea what you're capable of doing together when everybody starts to contribute their little bit of magic and it's like, wow, yeah. this is way better than I ever could have done by myself or even imagined doing by myself. So true. Yeah. yeah. And then, what's the last one? Oh yes, it's just that there are two different parts of pieces. There's the concept and there's the experience. And what's interesting is you can look at your pieces and some of you have really strong concepts and then I think your execution could have been stronger. <laughs> but some of you have amazing execution and then I think your concept could have been stronger. And then some of you managed to do this thing where you, I don't know how, because you didn't have that much time, but you really tied them really nicely together and they kind of like worked and the concept and the execution were like feeding each other. And so just in general, I don't think y'all had very much time. I don't know if you, I don't know if Ian and Marcel told you, but you didn't have enough time to do what you did. <laughs> Yeah. And you all did really well, given yeah. that. I was actually, I agree with yeah, David. I, I, was, I was really impressed. I was actually, yeah, honestly. I didn't, not that I didn't have yeah. faith in all of you, your yeah. disembodied faces, yeah. <laughs> but I hadn't met you yet, so I didn't know. And so I was really, really impressed by everything. It was great to see. I can't tell y'all, it's been yeah. so lovely being a part of this experience. And y'all, some of the questions that y'all have asked have been so informative and have been, I think, for both of us, kind of pushed us into thinking differently about things. Oh, absolutely. So, we feel, learned too. Yeah. Definitely, so feel really grateful for having been part of this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. All right, so now as we do Q&A for our projects, we're faced with the difficulty of this being a very big auditorium. And so we're gonna ask all of the students to come up to the stage, and then we'll have time for some audience Q&A and or questions for each other if the uh, audience is too small. And this, a great photo op. This is also the photo opportunity section of the evening. <laughs> we just didn't tell the truth. <laughs> well, we didn't know how we'd actually do this. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is going to be a bit of organized chaos by necessity of the size of our class. If you didn't fill out your course evaluations already and this didn't work out, don't fill them. No. <laughs> okay, you can. You can cue the music now, please, with danceability level uh, 0 0.8. Okay, great. Um, so I'd like to, we'd love some audience questions. So there are two floor mics located on that walkway now. Uh, come on down, ask questions, and uh, our, our students will be delighted to answer them. <laughs> we need the icebreaker question. <laughs> no, we've got a question. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to ask each of you, in the process of doing your project, did you discover a bias of your own, and what was it? The, the mic is here, you can yell. <laughs> Yeah, so one of the things that we wanted to mention in our presentation about AI and work is that some of us have actually had personal experience with implementing not quite AI, but kind of like autonomous um, systems. And so we noticed that there was a bias in some of our group members towards kind of like being very pro-tech. And that was kind of like, oh, I guess we've kind of always assumed it's a good thing. And yeah, it's an interesting perspective. Yeah. 
Okay, um, so I think from our group, so AI, a people's perspective, we had almost kind of like a, a bias that we end up being pretty ashamed of and that we had the bias that people that maybe didn't go to the University of Waterloo or came from certain um, academic or cultural backgrounds wouldn't be as um, knowledgeable about AI and we thought we would get certain responses and people blew us away with how much they did know and how knowledgeable they were. Um, and we thought they would know virtually nothing and we thought we kind of knew their answers ahead of time and we had the sculpture all planned out. And then the answers we got were so much more informed um, and the sculpture turned out completely different. So we were uh, ashamed of ourselves um, <laughs> for thinking that people who didn't go to the University of Waterloo were not um, as smart as we were. So that was shameful. <laughs> that was terrible. And we are glad that this project showed us otherwise. Um, so for our group, uh, Guilt Machines and Confession, the thing that I really realized about myself during the creation of the actual chatbot was just how strange my sense of diction is because I was the person that wrote up all the initial stuff for the chatbot, but once we tested it and did some Q&A on it, we realized, no, this does not flow at all and that it wasn't catching things it was supposed to because I was the only person that fed the initial training data in. So it really exposed the bias of what happens when you only have a singular person. And once we included a lot more people in, it got a lot better in terms of how I was able to pick stuff up and yeah. So, um, for <laughs> so for us, for Bias in the Black Box, the political spectrum, we definitely are obviously very different people. <laughs> but um, we had a lot of similar political leanings and a lot of similar ways that we would interpret things. But we also had things that we definitely like thought very differently of. So I think we tried to merge both of our perspectives into our um, into our like questioning, but obviously that we there are certain things that we are very similar in, and I think that was represented in our questions as well. Additionally, one bias that I personally had was I thought that our project wouldn't work at all, um, <laughs> but I'm proud to say uh, it was accurate about 70% of the time. He was only like half wrong, so that's so okay. you know that's nothing to stake a stick at. So you know, <laughs> stake a stick. <laughs> Um, so we're from, I'm from Project Mood, and so we basically uh, had this unbiased data set that we trained, but it was actually pretty biased because all the images that I were trained on were on like some Caucasian male with a really light background. So it would only really detect like between happy or sad if the image that was taken had uh, a white background, and then it could actually discern between happy or sad. So the unbiased data set was already biased on its own, basically. Um, we didn't realize how many like times we'd run into implications of like ethics, because like originally we had a whole bunch of different ideas for the confessional booth. We wanted to like print off the convers like the confession that you had as you were leaving the door, just to make it more jarring. But yeah, we didn't realize how many times we'd run into like the whole issue of ethics and what was okay. <laughs> So for Project Matthias, we realized a bias uh, during the installation phase and not to alienate most of the audience, but can everyone in the room put their hand up if they were alive in 1999? <laughs> Keep your hand up if you remember 1999. So our group did not. <laughs> uh, what we were going off of was what we understood that time for that individual that we were writing about, uh, we had to go off of our secondhand impressions. And it sounds like we were close enough, or it's either that we were really close or just everyone likes Super Tramp. Uh, it it's one of the two, and we recognized our biases. We just kind of have to go off of what we think it was like. You know, given that our project was explaining bias, our group just had no biases at all. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, more seriously, we found that um, some of these like, biases we would expect to have would be like really obvious in Spotify, like, oh, you're doing a terrible job, why aren't you addressing these things? But we found that they actually um, did have algorithms and methodologies for trying to address some of the things. So even though maybe your like, music recommendation isn't always perfect or as you want it to be, um, they're doing a lot of things to help address that. Go for it. 
for a little while. Um, I'm curious, is there anything that you guys will do differently as a result of this course? Anything that really comes to mind as a standout? Just like seeing the value of like collaborating with people from different fields is like, wow, mind blowing. Like I hope that I take this kind of perspective into like work and especially since a lot of us are graduating, I think it's really important to see what um, a, an entire group of people can create when we all are learning the same things in the first six weeks of class and how different all of our projects were. Like I think that's really, really important takeaway, uh, especially as we go into like the workforce and like continue to do projects. Just collaboration is huge. That's a big takeaway for me. Kind of building off of the interdisciplinary bit, I think seeking out more opportunities. So not just that, but also being aware of the way you communicate about things. Like some of the presentations today, I realized if I had gone like at the beginning of this term and listened to that presentation about TensorFlow or GUIs, I'd be like, what? And now at least I have some like I have awareness of the language. And I think that's really important when you're talking to people who are from a different field or who are talking very technical about fields outside of your own. Um, I think similar to what Pat said, um, one thing, big thing for me going through this entire course is how I approach conversation with people from different backgrounds and like the kind of assumptions I make about what they know and things like that and like just being a little bit more, one, open to like a perspective, but also to not making as many assumptions as like w their framework of understanding or like where they're coming from and being able to like effectively still communicate even with very different like backgrounds. Um, one thing I definitely am more aware of is problems that are probably being solved by AI. Because before it's that thing that Facebook and Google does with their data to make you have better ads. And now I look at things and I'm like, oh, in five years an AI is gonna do that. Like, you know, you're reading an article and you need to look something up, five years an AI is just gonna tell you what that is. Um, and so being just like constantly aware of that in your life. Um. I'm here, I'm studying knowledge integration, so we focus on a lot of collaboration and problem solving um, in an inherently interdisciplinary program. Um, but what I thought was kind of interesting about this course was our team was very interdisciplinary by faculty. Um, and in KI, we almost have a bias of all being interdisciplinary and excited about it and into it. Um, and so it was kind of neat to be here and kind of have our foot in a different kind of door and world and work with people. So I think something like this, uh, I feel like, is a bias from KI that I think we could do more of this to kind of, we preach collaboration and interdisciplinarity, but this was kind of a true test of our skills. Oh, oh well, I just wanted to answer about like what we learned about, well, what my takeaway from the course was. Uh, coming from a more technical background, um, I wasn't very in tune with like what AI is. It's just there, it's something, it's the new technology, it's what everyone's trying to work in uh, because it's popular, because it's gonna affect our lives. But as a programmer, I have someone who makes it, we sometimes don't tune into how that affects other people, how our program uh, can cause bias, can cause um, prejudice in the judicial system, for example, and how that affects uh, people who are non-programmers or the end users. So. Uh, in that perspective, uh, later on going, going down the road when I'm coding, I will definitely keep in mind uh, why am I doing this kind of thing? Are there other ways that I can do it? Can I be more inclusive in how I implement uh, certain technology? I have a question. Oh, that's really loud. Um, so it's kind of directed at Project Matt, but everyone as well. So you guys were talking about how you started referring to it as he and that kind of empathy. So do you have any thoughts on human rights or just rights in general being applied to AI in the future? All right, I guess I have to answer this question, don't I? Um, because we're dating, if you didn't know that, anyway. Um, <laughs> so thanks for bringing back hum philosophy 328, human rights, to the forefront of my mind right now. Um, 
So yes, I do think that uh, human rights need to adapt in the face of this new challenge. Um, I think I'll just do a shameless plug of my essay and say that we probably need to do uh, some more work on the front of privacy because uh, as data becomes more and more intimate, uh, including physiological data, but uh, Recent neuroscientific advances mean that you can map people's brain waves, and uh, certain things about their uh, neural spike trains mean that you can predict, remove, replicate, and uh, delete memories, as well as really high-level, um, high-level beliefs. So when things get that intimate, I think our uh, conception of AI and what it can do to us uh, needs to help shape uh, our human rights. On, especially on the privacy front, but also uh, in terms of our freedom to think the way we want and not be under the control of a government, not to throw out a Second Amendment type of notion, but I think those are the two main things we'd have to cons uh, concern ourselves with. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> okay, one last, oh, because I have, then I won't. I want to group each group specifically. Yeah, no, I don't. Yeah. yeah, come on. Okay, if we don't have time, just cut me off. Sorry, audience, tell me too if it's boring. Um, so, guilt machines and confession. A lot of your project is really leaning on this faith. I don't know where y'all are. But, okay, a lot of your project is leaning on this faith analogy and this metaphor of the confessional. But in fact, there are a lot of different ways that you can confess things. And like therapy can be a space of confession or there's sort of like families as being a place where you can also confess. So I'm wondering how, if you had to use a different metaphor, if you couldn't use this faith metaphor for your piece, how would you have changed it? <laughs> so, the reason we originally picked the space was because we wanted to take something extremely traditional so we could lean on that and then have the chatbot be kind of bad um, because we were never going to have a good chatbot. We sort of knew that from the start. And so I think if we were to choose a different space, we would probably do the therapist couch and then if we could do some sort of voice relayed system even if it's just a person in another room typing into like Microsoft Sam and then just like listening to your response. Um, something that brings comfort in familiarity is where we're really going for, uh, especially with such a personal topic. Mm. Um, you want to have the space bring comfort and rituals and familiarity bring that comfort. So when we're thinking about spaces, we wanted to do something where there's a traditionality to it. There's a flow, there's a ritual, there's a procedure that you follow. I mean, in Catholic, you kneel down and you say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. In the therapist's couch, you sit down and they say, what's troubling you today? Um, and those sorts of rituals, they get you past the first initial energy barrier into actually saying what's on your mind. Um, and in something this, uh, this personal, the chatbot can't really ever break that. That has to be broken by the space, I think. And so when talking about other spaces we might use, that's what I would gravitate towards. I actually have a slightly different answer. <laughs> um, I know we're one cohesive team, but sorry. <laughs> um, I would choose something um, like the role of a best friend. So there's a game, a PC game, called Emily is Away. Right. And they, or no, not Emily is Away. Um, I, I can't remember what it's called. But basically, you're in the role of someone's friend and you're chatting over I am. Um, and you know it's a game when you start playing, uh, but by the end, um, there's, it's like a choose your own adventure, so depending on what happens, you can get different endings. And by the end of that game, even though I knew it was just a game, I was bawling. Um, I was super connected to it, and the fact that it wasn't real or it never really happened didn't matter to me because uh, the emotions that it evoked were very real. So I think that um, confession is definitely tradition, but best friends have been around forever. Um, human to human trust is you know, essential to society. So I think that that could be also a really powerful way. And if the chatbot, um, I honestly believe if we had more time, we could make it really good. So I think that that would be a really powerful way to do the same thing just from a different angle.
Yeah, I think, I think y'all were smart to take from that, all of that imagery, because the whole confessional faith, there's so much. But you're right, it would, I'm just curious what it would expose if you did it from a different perspective. So, thank you. Mm, AI, will you work? <laughs> so I really applaud the physicality of your group and the making, like getting us to walk through and all the different routes and the research that you did. Um, I am going to so put a poke, so I just want to make sure I ask you a question. So there's some research and disability studies that shows that when you put people in the perspective of other people's shoes, so if you're like, here, try sitting in a, in a wheelchair and see what that's like, it doesn't generate empathy at all. What it does generate is two things. One is that people say, I'm glad that's not me. And the other thing is that they say that's really hard. And then they kind of walk away. So I'm curious what you wanted from your project. Were you trying to generate this kind of empathy? If so, then what do you, knowing this kind of information about disability studies, does that change what you were doing? Or was there a different, a different like end goal that you were trying to have? Okay, uh, I can begin to give a response as my teammates reflect. Um, <laughs> For me, empathy was not a primary goal, but rather to... Yeah, but you're the CEO, so... <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, I think that reflection as to how AI will impact people uh, was more important, at least for me. I don't know about the other five members of my team. Uh, we had some interesting discussions about the importance of empathy. Uh, what, but the, to cause people to reflect was our goal on how AI could impact them rather than to begin to feel the emotional side. Uh, however, we did try to cast the characters as being uh, not uh, cast to a specific gender, for example, um, so, or have other race characteristics involved so that we could have people relate to them better. Um. Interestingly enough, um, I, my goal was as a designer to try and have some element of empathy for the character to relate to someone who is being fired and doesn't have all of the information for why or needs to now find a new job and you kind of to empathize and understand that this impact that AI will have on society will impact society in general, not just a particular person. Um, but I definitely agree with you and it was something that we did struggle to try and integrate into our exhibit because of time and because of immersion, I think, too. We tried to have objects, but it wasn't as immersive, I think, as it could have been to maybe further the empathy, but that was something. And we had some really interesting discussions about empathy and the role of that in our design because we did come from very different perspectives and even just, you can tell, from the two of us talking very differently about the exhibit. It was a really, I think, interesting learning experience for all of us, so, yeah, I don't know. Well done, y'all. So I, I just want to add <laughs> <laughs> something. Um, so f coming from my background in systems design engineering, we really look at things from like a human perspective. So um, prior to actually building out our story, we built out our characters uh, in terms of personas. So personas in design um, is one way to um, evoke empathy in either your users or in the designers ourselves. So by seeing it through these three different views, so initially we wanted to just see things from the view of a factory worker and the CEO, but we realized that um, things aren't as clear cut as you know, the boss and the employee. So by putting in that middle manager, the plant manager in there, we want to be able to um, showcase to people that it's not just the person making the decision and the person who's you know, being fired or whatnot. So by um, exploring these different personas, we ourselves were able to explore um, what were, not just like what their decisions are or what their options are, but what they might be thinking. So in our activity, for example, for the CEO, um, there's a lot of numbers that are given to the participants. And so if you're just looking at the numbers, there are certain options that look a lot better than others. This is cheaper, this is faster, this will make us more efficient. But from a more personal level, by being 200% you know, more efficient, by cutting X dollars in cost, that means there's a lot of other potential human impact to it. So um, I guess drawing like, from my personal experience in uh, my previous co-op experiences, where I was involved with some companies that were undergoing similar uh, changes in their organization, where they're bringing technology 
that would um, replace, so to speak, some of their employees. Um, and me being in a position where I didn't really have control over what happens to those employees, but actually being able to understand those employees and understand uh, the people who are making those decisions. Um, I wanted to just bring in, you know, it's not just saving money and firing people, but there's a lot of other things that go into that as well. And uh, sorry, I know we're pretty low on time, but I had a very quick, uh, very quick question for you, Mimi. Uh, which were the projects that had both good concepts and good execution? <laughs> All of them. Um, yeah, I'm gonna move on. Well, actually, do we have time? I don't think we do. No. Okay, and is, okay. <laughs> All right, well, but really do tell me. For you. Okay, uh, Project Mood. So I think y'all's project was really interesting to me because again, it gets at this difference between the process versus the output, and it, you showed us in your presentation a lot of the process, so we could see how much it took you. And I'm not sure all of that showed up as much in the, pres in, in the actual experience. I, I felt, well, I felt like I, was, I could kind of see it, but I don't know what it would be like for, for other people. Uh, but it's clear you did put a lot into it, and there was just one thing that I got caught up on in yours, is the labeling of your three data sets, where two of them are biased, and one of them you say is unbiased. Although one of you spoke and said, oh, it yeah, kind of wasn't. Tell us about this, why, why label it as unbiased if you're gonna come up and then tell us that it isn't? <laughs> Do you wanna talk about it or you? It wasn't supposed to be biased at first, but when we were training, when I was training the data sets, um, it didn't, like I was testing other images rather than the images that, that were used uh, to test the validation and accuracy using that set. I was using like random Google images and it wasn't accurately like, um, the, the finding if it was uh, the the person was happy or sad and I was like oh why is that so then I so then I just like looked at what what because it was um from her one of her assignments the the actual unbiased data set and uh, I was trying to see like what was it actually training on as happy or sad and so like I just printed out some of the images that it was training on it was just like this the same guy but like smiling not smiling with like a super like white uh, street background and I was like oh. The images actually that that it was being used to train on for this happy house model were actually like biased in terms of um, that like it it could only accurately define what happy or sad was if the if the test image you threw in looked like the same white background with like the same guy smiling or not smiling then it could detect if it was happy or sad. Mm, yeah, cause uh, so. There's one like rule of thumb for training data is that the data source but must be like the same from like you cannot have like combination of different data sources. So here the reason why the Jaffe, the Asian women's data sets and the glasses data sets doesn't fit on our data model is that it's already like getting sourced from like different data sets. So our pre, uh, original model is trying to like uh, serving as a key to a house. So usually uh, the background of like a, like, a, like a camera in front of a house is like, we are not like just black and white, it's RGB photos, right? So, so because of like, uh, initially the model is trained for like as a key, but later on we, we think of that since we are trying to think of bias, uh, then the Asian women, the black and white, and the glasses photos can kind of treat as like a different source. So that's why we treat this as kind of like biased data sets. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. And I think that actually your desire to simplify that, in trying to simplify it, you missed the like really interesting point, which is this, the yeah. weirdness of that moment. I think there's something really interesting about that moment, that if you were gonna keep going, I would say, oh, you should <laughs> dive into that. <laughs> yeah, which is great, thank y'all. Okay. okay, exploring bias with music. I have nothing bad to say, y'all like walk up so. <laughs> well, we there's figured good. it was kind of some kind of like um, question, so we figured the entire team should be on here in case we got stuck. So we don't look so you can't get stuck. This is a celebration. <laughs> These are, all, and I'm telling you, they really are all really good. Uh, I thought that y'all had a really like very slick presentation of your project uh, that was also noteworthy because you didn't need to 
some y'all was, you had somebody standing there all, uh, like at every point of the day, but actually you didn't need to have anyone. They could, we could kind of come into it very easily without you, which was interesting. So you did this work in kind of categorizing the bias. And you know, I've also done some work in creating these categories for understanding things. And I find that that can be really useful, but it can also be very limiting. And so I'm wondering if when you were categorizing these different types of bias, what, what didn't fit in the categories or which one did you struggle with the most? So we based our whole project on a paper uh, that was published this year. But what we found challenging is when we try to apply these biases to a specific example. Right, and exactly. And then you have to find examples for this specific project and maybe they don't apply directly for this. And then we found maybe other biases that were not directly involved here. And I think for different models you could find more or less. And when and you, sorry. No. Just in doing that, did you ever have moments where you ended up like shifting, you're like, oh, this example doesn't fit here, so maybe we can tweak it and put it here. Yeah, or we have to change a lot. Of our whole thing <laughs> changed the direction dramatically. How so? Because Briefly, sorry. Because we had this previous, we had this idea of what it was going to be, and then turns out our ideas weren't ex exactly replicated in the project, in the Spotify database. Yeah. Oh. I would say sort of like specifically some of the things were um, like looking at our historical and representation bias. And especially for music, we're like, what is the historical bias? Like, what does that mean in terms of music? It was sort of like weird to d distinguish. And sometimes things like, oh, is this historical bias or representation bias? And it seems very like fluid and similar and like less clear and distinct mm. than sometimes presented for like in the paper and the different examples. Mm. Oh, that's Sorry, taking notes for myself. Thanks. But yeah, that's, um, I thought you were, because your presentation was so slick, I would have loved to hear more about this, those moments of like when it didn't fit and how you got it to the point that you did. Because I felt. Initially, we had a different idea for every single poster. Would we had totally different topics for each of them. But then we thought it might be more cohesive if we take music and then try to find mm. that. But then it, whatever. Okay, if we had more time, I'd be like, oh, I want to hear more about this. And like, usually with presentations, you want to show the pretty front end and you don't want to show the messy back end. Uh, so we wanted to show like how cohesive it was or like how nice it was. And I didn't want to show like the mess behind <laughs> the fact. Yeah, and like, like the first group, I think you made a really smart decision with that. And I just am interested in the messiness behind just because why not? But yeah, great, thanks y'all. Okay, AI people's perspective. I think that y'all, you actually, this thing that you did where you were like, oh, let's get from people what they think this thing looks like and then let's build it. That almost seems like it could be like a YouTube series or something. <laughs> like you could do this for, you could be like, what's, uh, what do you, what's cryptocurrency? Yeah. And then whatever people say, you just build yeah. whatever yeah. and then you like present <laughs> that. I actually, I was like, that's really interesting. Let's do it. So y'all did, I was talking before about this demonstrating versus like asserting and you did this thing where you represented what people thought of, a, of as AI. And that is different than if you had been like, this is what we want people to think of. So if you were to do that other work, rather than taking what people think, but instead like building a thing that's how you wish that AI looked, what would that look like? Um, yeah, so one of our original iterations on this project was actually to build something that looked like AI, but actually was not in fact AI whatsoever. And trying to see if we gave it to people would they believe that maybe it could do those types of things. So that I think that kind of was our original um, idea and goal in this type of project, uh, seeing how people would react to something if it maybe looked sleek and shiny, had a screen, was maybe black and metallic. So that would highly take a lot of our opinions and biases of what we think AI looks like and represents. Uh, so we just wanted to flip that around a little bit and kind of put it back on the people uh, and take their perspective and put it into something else instead of our ideas into one thing. Mm. I don't know if anyone else has something to add. Great, I think it worked well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bias in the black box. Um, <laughs> I thought yours was very simple and illustrated your point really well. And my question is specifically, if you could change the presentation of it, so you had like your black thing, then you had those. If you had an unlimited budget and you could present <laughs> the same project, but totally differently, what would you do? Yeah, so we had so many different ideas of how to like represent this. We kind of knew like what we wanted to do, but 
yeah, we didn't have an unlimited budget. <laughs> so one of the things that we were talking about was like maybe projecting something onto a wall and then based on like the answers that people gave, we would have different slides and it would either, cr it would create different images. So instead of having like a sum of um, like different chocolates, you would have a sum of different slides and it would create a different picture. Um, another thing that we thought of was like creating an actual black box and then having like one side be super simple and then you come around and you see all the different workings and like the flow charts and you could really analyze that. Um, but yeah, I think the way that we ended up doing it was the simplest way because we wanted to like capture people's attention in like the easiest, like quickest way. Yeah, but the, this slide one, I wanna talk more about that because <laughs> I thought it was super cool. So like we were gonna have every answer to the question would give you a different little slide. Maybe it's like a different colored piece of like plastic or something. You put it in front of a projector and you like stack them up and then it'll create like an image. That would have been super cool, but <laughs> I had no idea how to do that. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what you had still worked, so it's good. Well done, y'all. Um, artifacts. AI artifacts. Uh, I saw that David got a copy of the game, and I'm curious why I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he asked. <laughs> we have extras, though, if you really do want one. Fair. Um, I think, so for y'all, I, yeah, I thought this was really well done. I don't know who did the design for it, too. It was <laughs> really well done. Uh, and I think that, I actually think you should consolidate and tighten some of your categories. I think you had maybe, like some of them you could maybe put together. I don't know, it's up to you. But what I'm curious about is that y'all seemed like you did uh, the most, all of you did a lot of research, but you did a spe very specific type of it where you had to go and look at all of these policy decisions. And you had all these different categories. So what was the policy decision that surprised you or like stuck out, stood out to you the most of all of the ones that you presented? And maybe that's different for, for different ones of you. I can go first. <laughs> um, I think for me, I don't know if it was like the the one that we looked into for Russia um, and that it was actually like created this policy where like part of it is that they're going to put it towards um, like work on AI towards like war games and things like that. Um, that was surprising at the same time not surprising <laughs> um, and I think that also kind of like reflected my own bias when I was looking into it because on the one hand when I read it I was like oh not surprising it's Russia but then I was also like I guess like given like a Canadian perspective on it like that's that's the impression you know when you're like looking at um, major players like that but that one just surprised me in the sense that like the language of it was a lot stronger I think um, and because it was like especially like autonomous weapons and everything is such a, a big topic and just that um, even thinking like that Russia is a part of the permanent um, UN Security Council like and the fact that um, there that's something that they're actively pursuing that to me was surprising in the sense that it was like so open mm. yeah I don't know about you guys. Um, I found I was quite surprised looking at like more of the positive policies, like the SDGs. Um, coming into this, I didn't know that much about AI, but I took a course on the ethics of autonomous weapons um, over um, a few years ago. But anyway, so I had this like negative perception of AI and kind of as we started to collect our policies, we did have very negative trends and then we kind of sat down and we're like, okay, like maybe let's look into some positive avenues and we actually were able to find a lot. Um, and again, we could have definitely consolidated more categories, but we are trying to find very specific examples for the game, and there's a lot of policy out there that, like I said, is so vague, it's difficult to kind of communicate in a playable game. Um, so that was. I guess I was most surprised about some of the policies that didn't exist. In particular, um, a lot of, when we looked at policies for AI ethics, or in just in general, a lot of the topics seem to be, rather than finding concrete policies, they said things like, we're gonna convene an expert panel, or sort of like, we take the position that say, AI hey, needs to be more fair and stuff like that, which isn't really a policy. I mean, it's a good position to have, but it's the, like, it's not really probably what's necessary from a policy perspective. So just the fact that, and, and you know, when they say we convene a panel or something like that, that effectively means that they haven't really figured it out yet, so they're still working on it. Um, so what, which I think is good, but I was sort of hopeful that some of these things be worked out more. And even uh, a good example recently, like the general data protection 
rights, I, I think the GDPR Act, which is for data privacy in Europe, like it's not perfect, but they put something forward just sort of as a placeholder because something is better than nothing and then they're I guess, working to sort of refine that. So I was hoping, I guess, to see more of that uh, for other fields like ethics in particular and was kind of disappointed that that didn't, wasn't there. Mm. I think for me, the ones that surprised me were Russia, China, and Germany. I look at all these policies from a culture perspective. So once I actually found out about the policies, I was like, oh, like, of course, like, this makes sense that Russia is invested in a war, war game plan. Um, like, that is part of their culture. Like, they don't have, they don't consider ethics as much. Um, with China, of course, like, China would have a social credit policy. Like, it makes sense. Like, they fear chaos. Like, it would make sense that the government is trying to control their citizens using this social credit policy and I guess with Germany, um, Germany was the one that surprised me the most because even though Germany is a European Union member um, and you're, I find European member um, countries to be very social leaning um, and I found that Germany was very specific with autonomous weapons like why is Germany very specific with autonomous, um, autonomous vehicles as opposed to other European Union countries so I guess all the, those countries surprised me with their policies. Um, for me personally, I thought the, uh, the policy associated with the drones with Amazon was a bit shocking. Um, just because when I was researching it, the sort of the flow of the timeline seemed like Amazon proposed it, and there was very little protest from government to have it approved. Um, because I know in the past, a lot of safety concerns about having flying objects in terms of bringing things into and out of the country, and so if that is something that's government approved, uh, I, I thought there would have been more um, protest in terms of getting that going. Each of those seems like you could go so much deeper into it, which is, which is great. Thanks, y'all. Okay, finally, I think, yeah, Matt. So with Mood, I already talked about how difficult it is to like work on software and how much you commend that, blah, blah, I'm not gonna get into that. Um, y'all obviously, y'all like um, AI Will You Work, you also had this very, like, you know, you had this physical, very, well, like a couple of groups had a very physical experience. And for you, I'm just curious about one thing, which is how do you think it would have changed your piece if you didn't make it an individual experience? Uh, we found out the second half of the day when it wasn't an individual experience anymore. Uh, oh, not. No, because when each person going in, uh, the maximum we did mention was 25 minutes. We wanted to get people to be able to see this exhibit and that towards the end involved we have this amount of time that everyone can interact with Matt and we have this as multiple people are going in at once and experiencing the room more fully. So what initially seemed like it was negative that you weren't getting that one-on-one -on -one interaction, we realized that it allowed people to interact with the room more, which helped to really sell the authentic experience of the conversation as coming from a perspective. So it did amplify that uh, we had a better experience, even if it was slightly different than the one we intended on. That, I think that last point is so good to end on, how I think once you have people actually look at your pieces, and you all kind of saw this, the experience that you thought you would create it is so different than the one that it actually is, and then that becomes the point at which you're like, okay, if we're gonna do this again, or change it, then that, that's where you like intersect. And I'm just so glad that all of you got to do this, and you all did such a good job, and thank you for answering all my questions. Okay, so I'm going to speak for 40 seconds, give it to Marcel, and then we have to go eat. Um, the three things I want to say is, first, it's shocking to think that this is week 12 of a course, that 12 weeks ago, we all gathered here at the Valsili School for the first time, and we really didn't know each other. And then we did, like, six weeks of readings and talking, and the, these projects really came together in, like, since reading week, in six weeks. So they're amazing projects. Um, the second thing I just want to say is that it'll be shocking to many of the students on the stage, but sometimes profs are, are happy when courses are over because we don't have to teach anymore. And this is not the case. I'm going to be bummed next Thursday night. I'm going to miss you all. So this is a really fun, fun class. So yeah, it's just been truly remarkable. So I'll turn it over to Marcel actually to say a few more words of thank you. But just join me in thanking you all. It's been a remarkable 12 weeks. I won't take too long. Uh, I just, I don't always show it, but I'm really happy inside. <laughs> no, uh, really, I had, I don't think I've ever had a more uh, kind of relaxed, easygoing group of students to work with. You guys are amazing. 
And uh, I like Ian, I'm gonna miss you. It's like a little culture that we had going here and I uh, hope we can uh, keep it going in some way. Thanks.